lines are interesting things. They're pretty simple, and yet at times they can be very meaningful. Take this line, for example. By itself, it doesn't look too important, but in its proper context, it is a very meaningful thing. This line speaks eloquently about a quiet revival in the city of Boston over the last 40 years. There's been some very significant revivals in Boston, but all of those revivals are rather obvious. Everyone knows about them. But this revival, which represents probably the highest level of growth for the kingdom over the longest time period, is invisible. We have tried to understand this line, this growth of Christianity, for decades. The more we studied it, the more we found that uh, things were starting to sound familiar as to what caused it. For example, uh, we discovered that the revival probably began with the poorest of the poor of the city. Uh, people who had very little money, people who were in storefront churches, people who had nothing uh, and uh, of this world's uh, things, uh, people who were not even considered uh, uh, vital to Christianity uh, began the revival. And, uh, and so this poverty thing uh, made it invisible from the start. And uh, it also made it biblical from the start. Not many wise are chosen, not many noble, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. And so here we are in the beginning of a revival in the Western world, uh, 2,000 years later, in a city that's a half a world away, and it's starting the same way. But it has not stayed with the poor. It has gone to all sorts of ethnic groups, some of which are quite well off. So the revival has cross-fertilized across economic lines rather significantly, across denominational lines, you know, well over a hundred countries of substantial people from each country in the city. So it's gone way beyond the poor, but I always want to remember where it started because that was critical to a biblical model for how it how it originated. Back in the 70s, if you put a map of where the, all the new churches were, and you put a map of where the worst slums were, the map of the churches and the slums perfectly overlapped. They were all being born in the slum areas. What's interesting today is the kind of slums we had back in the 60s and 70s and 80s do not exist in this city at all today. It's not that we don't have a lot of poor here. There are a lot of poor here. But uh, we no longer have those slums. We no longer have those economic problems that they created. And the churches were very significant in changing their communities. So the social implications of the revival were enormous. But not only did uh, changes happen in the city socially, the other reason why we say it was very biblical is because it automatically went to the region and the world. These people were from countries across the world and they were following their diaspora peoples who were all over New England, and uh, they were following their diaspora people systems who were all over the U.S. and all over the world. As many churches as were planted in Boston, Boston churches planted more churches outside the city of Boston than they did in. And so here again we have another situation where Acts 1-8 uh, was happening. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. The Bible was happening. One of the problems of Christianity when, it, when we came in, in the 60s and in the early 70s was that Christianity was seen as a, a problem practically. And uh, the secular community was very toxic to Christianity. Uh, social work and everything that was happening in universities, public government and so forth. What's interesting today, we have this highly secular city and that city gives hundreds of thousands of dollars to the secular world to the Christian world. That didn't exist before. You know, if we start dealing with something like youth violence, okay, the secular community is extremely interested in that topic. A major study on, on this very topic, a study that would normally be done at Harvard or MIT was done here. And it was done because secular money flowed into us and because secular universities and other uh, consulting groups provided the expertise to do it. They, they can see us uh, providing answers for problems that they see as very, very real. And the Christian community is there to do that. This again is an indication of so many things where problems were turned into assets. The problems of the past, the slums became the 
assets of church development that produced enormous churches. Some of those churches planted in the slums are some of our largest churches in the city today. And so the redemptive effect of the gospel was uh, enormously seen in our city. Uh, I can't think of a significant problem that existed in the 60s and 70s that wasn't eventually turned into an asset in the growth of Christianity in Boston in this quiet revival. The old reality to me was that Christianity went to the world of dominantly relational culture people. And that was what the old reality was uh, and still is in many parts of the world. But the new reality is we have cultures like Boston and like many major cities in the Western world and increasingly in Asia and other places as well, where you have a very wealthy class of people where 50% of the world live in cities. This is a new reality and uh, the kinds of things that worked in the old reality are not seeming to work here. In fact, while we were growing the faith dramatically in the non-Western world and in uh, non-urban environments across the world, uh, our Christianity was declining uh, in the Western world and in our cities and in our secular uh, venues and so forth. We have been losing the war uh, in, uh, in reaching the Western world and reaching this new reality of the urban world. But Boston, uh, I feel, represents a beginning of the end, where actually we've had a 40-year revival in a secular city in the heart of the Western world. And we need to now uh, launch into a more substantial uh, effort beyond this city, because we believe there are quiet revivals very similar to our own in many cities across the world. God never stops building his kingdom. And that is a process that can include dynamic shifts in the landscape of ministry. A city without walls means a new kind of reality. Say it with me. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Say it. O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Amen. Amen. My name is John Savak Ray, and I am pastor of Christ the King Episcopal Church in Lilburn, Georgia, which is part of Metro Atlanta. One of the most exciting parts of an ethnic ministry summit is what happens during the planning stage, what happens during the summit itself, and what happens after the summit supposedly ends. I say supposedly ends because it doesn't really end for tomorrow evening. It goes on and it grows and it expands because what happened in the planning of the summit was that many Fellowships, ministries, churches came together to make this happen. And they're here now. And they will continue being together after the summit finishes in this place. It doesn't finish. It doesn't end. The body of Christ continues to show its unity of purpose in making the good news of the gospel known to all ethnicities, wherever they are, in this region, in this city, in greater Boston. So tonight, our offering will support the ongoing intercultural ministry of churches, of fellowships, of uh, other organizations, Christian organizations, here in the Boston area. That's what's happened in my city of Atlanta, from in 2006, it happened in Seattle, it's happened in Phoenix, that the, the people who came together, the people of God who came together, stayed together and did great things, are doing great things together. That's what we want to happen and continue happening here as well. So tonight, we want to ask you to open your hearts and give generously for the ongoing work of the gospel to some of the churches you saw that they will continue to work together 
as this summit has made possible, as you've been doing before. This will continue until the earth is filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's what we want to happen. So I, I'm, I'm reminded of St. Paul's words as I speak to you this evening. Each one of you must give as you've made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You're going to give cheerfully tonight? Give. Give that the work that has begun will continue and continue and continue through the work of this ethnic ministry summit that happens in years to come, years and years to come. Let me give you some instructions. And while I'm giving instructions, you can start working on this. First of all, make your checks payable to, Bill, to the Billy Graham Center. The Billy Graham Center is the holding body, if you like, for EANs, finances. It's the channel. It's the conduit through which we work. So uh, what you're really giving to is the ongoing work of uh, this summit. But make the check out. If you're going to write out a check generously to the Billy Graham Center. And then the ushers are going to come forward now. We have the ushers come forward. Because if you're donating cash and would like a tax-deductible receipt, which means you're going to give substantially, um, that then uh, the ushers, if you raise your hand, the ushers will give you envelopes in which to put that uh, cash, put your name and your address on that, and you will get a tax-deductible receipt after that. Do you want to make known who's, who's going to give? Come on, people. <laughs> give. <laughs> Put your hand up, and, and the ushers will give you these envelopes. Uh, does that mean all the rest of you are writing checks? Hey, that's wonderful. <laughs> but um, do this cheerfully. And then um, we, we got all those who want to give through an envelope. Write your name, your address on that. Um, take your time to do that. And then the and I'm going to pray in a moment, and then the ushers will take up the offering so that the work of God goes on happening. It doesn't stop. It goes on. It goes on because of you, because of me. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you so much for this day and all that has happened in it. Thank you so much that you make it possible for us, unworthy as we are, to be your partners in your great mission in your world. Father God, I pray that at this moment you will touch hearts, you will touch lives, you will touch wallets and checkbooks too, so that people here, your people, who've sung your praises, who have enjoyed what's happening at this summit, will be motivated by your spirit, moved by your spirit, to give so that the work, your work, will go on. Let there not be any shortage of what is needed for fellowships to continue for ministries to blossom and flourish as we hold hands, work together for your glory and your kingdom, Lord God. So tonight, look on your people and bless them with generous hearts to give as you have given us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you. That was great. That was great. Just by the way, before I pray, thank God for what he's enabled us to do this evening. I am a Christian from Pakistan. And Bishop, this may be the first time that a Pakistani has stood before your podium, before your church. I hope it won't be the last. There'll be many more. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you that you gave your all on the cross for us. What we have given you is just a small token of our gratitude, of our love for you. Keep that love going in our hearts and showing in our lives so that this, what we have given you this evening will be multiplied many times over for the growth of your kingdom and that many will come to know and love you, Lord Jesus, as we love you this evening. Amen. Well, I'm just a plain old white guy, all right? But I hope it's not the last time we're up here too, uh, Bishop. Good to be here tonight. <laughs> yeah, I feel like a minority here tonight. That's the way it's going. <laughs> For the past 10 years or so, our church, Grace Chapel, has been on a journey toward becoming a more multicultural church. And for the most part, we feel like we have just been going along for the ride. In other words, we feel as though it's something that God's been doing that we could not have engineered. He's brought people to us. He's changed hearts. He's given us connections to some of the growing ethnic communities around us. And we just marvel and celebrate what he's been doing among us. But along the way, we have taken a few intentional steps to try to facilitate uh, that journey. And one of them was to set aside a weekend every year to celebrate our increasing cultural diversity. We simply call it Cultural Awareness Weekend, and we take a break from everything else we were doing and just celebrate the various cultures we had in our midst and uh, declare it to be a value of ours and to ask God to do more of that in our midst in the days to come. And typically, we would invite a guest speaker to come and challenge us and stretch our thinking and cast vision for that. Now, every pastor knows that one of the wonderful things about a guest speaker is that they can say things you can't say. Because they don't have to stick around and deal with the aftermath. They can just say it and leave town. Uh, they can get in people's faces. They can rattle cages. They can mess with people's heads. And uh, you know you're going to have to do some pastoral work afterwards. But you also know you will have broken some barriers and plowed some new ground and uh, moved down the field a little bit. So we would bring in speakers to do that. Well, one year, at kind of a critical point in our journey, we invited uh, uh, the Reverend Dr. Sung Chan Ra to come be our speaker. Now, at that time, uh, Sung Chan was uh, pastoring a multicultural church right here in Cambridge. And he'd been doing some writing and speaking and was increasingly becoming a voice for multiculturalism in the church. And so we invited him to come and uh, be our speaker. And I didn't know him that well, but I had read just enough of his uh, work to know that he would indeed challenge us and get in our faces and rattle some cages and mess with people's heads. And I encouraged him to. I said, go for it, Sung John. You know, let him have it. What I wasn't expecting is that he would rattle my cage <laughs> and uh, get in my face and mess with my head and my heart. Uh, his message that day, I heard it four times, so I got it down pretty good. Uh, his message that day was visionary and challenging and biblically grounded, uh, but it was also provocative and convicting and even disturbing. So I knew I'd have some pastoral work to do after Sung John left, but I also knew I had some work to do in my own soul first. So I called Sung John the next day and said, we need to do breakfast. <laughs> and uh, we met in Arlington at Panera's and uh, had a great, great conversation for an hour and a half or so, uh, challenging, growing, stretching kind of a conversation that uh, was significant in my own life and leadership. And uh, that weekend truly did become an inflection point in our journey. And we began taking some more strategic and intentional steps after that and uh, helped to uh, get us where we are today, which is still on the way, but farther than we were. So 
uh, we, we still look back on that weekend, uh, Sung Chan, and uh, give thanks for it. Uh, since that time, the Lord has broadened uh, Sung Chan's ministry. He now is a uh, professor of evangelism and church growth uh, out at North Park Theological Seminary. He has a new book out uh, entitled The Next Evangelicalism, Releasing the Church from Western Cultural Captivity. That'll mess with your head, right? Okay. <laughs> So I don't know what uh, Sung Chan has on his heart tonight, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be provocative and challenging and rattle our cages a little bit. Let's welcome Reverend Dr. Sung Chan Ra. Thank you. Thank you. It is good to be home. Boston is my home. I was a campus minister here for five years. I was a pastor here for 10. I was uh, serving in this community alongside many of you here as a pastor, as a student, as a campus minister. So it's good to be home. And I just realized I'm in the big leagues now because I stand at the same place that Bishop Thompson sits at. <laughs> the little Asian man has made it. I am in the same <laughs> pulpit. Of Bishop Gilbert Thompson, praise the Lord. <laughs> I say this because I've been such an admirer of Bishop Thompson. As, as someone who's pastored in this city, you know that uh, you know the work that Bishop Thompson has done and the gift he is to this community. So thank you for the work you do here. And it's good to see so many friends, uh, Pastor Steve Chin, Pastor Larry Ward, I'm, uh, Craig McMullen, uh, I mean everywhere, Dean Borgman, Elton Villafania, Al Padilla, I'm just looking around and seeing all the friends from all these past 15 years, and um, it is really good to be home. So friends, uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today. I want, us to, I want to challenge us today. I want us to think about some things and reflect on some things, and I want to talk about the way that God is at work in changing our world. And in the process of changing our world, what is he calling us to as the people of God? To prepare for what he's doing in our midst right now. Now here's the great thing. This is not something that's going to happen 40, 50 years from now. It's something that is happening right now. And Boston is one of those places where we're seeing it happen first. Faster than in other cities. And faster than even maybe other parts of the country. This is where it's happening first. And so I want to talk about some of the things that are happening in our world, particularly in the city of Boston, and where God's Spirit is moving, and how we can be a part of the great work that He's doing. And I want to do it by looking at Acts chapter 15. I'm going to ask you to open your, uh, your Bibles to Acts chapter 15 and keep it open to that passage. And I believe that any time we look at the Scriptures, we need to understand the context out of which Acts 15, or a passage, comes out of. And so I want us to understand that in Acts chapter 15, we are dealing with the story of the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council is convened right here in the middle of this book because something has happened in the city of Jerusalem. Something has happened in the nation of Israel. Something has happened in the Roman Empire. What had happened was that there has been a long history of animosity between Jews and Gentiles. There had been conflicts. The Jews were a conquered people. The Gentiles had conquered the Jews, and there was this constant conflict over the years between the Jews and Gentiles. Yet, at the same time, Christianity was born out of the context of Judaism. So the first Christians were Jews. And so out of this context of Judaism comes Christianity, but here's the interesting part of this. In Acts chapter 15, when the Jerusalem council is convened, there is coming a moment when there is about to be a shift, and there are about to be more Gentile believers in Jesus than there are about to be Jewish believers in Jesus. Now this is a major, major moment. Because when Christianity first started in the uh, first century in the context of Judaism, people believed this was just an extension of Judaism or a subset of Judaism. The Jewish Christians would still go to their synagogues and their temples. They would just have a house church off to the side. So in the first century, it was an assumption that Christianity was kind of bounded within the context of Judaism. But here was the amazing thing. Paul the Apostle would go to these cities throughout the Roman Empire, and there would be converts. But they wouldn't necessarily be Jewish converts, they would be Gentile converts. And at this moment that the Jerusalem Council is convened in Acts chapter 15, what we're about to encounter is the transition from a church that had been dominated by Jewish Christians to a church that numerically was about to be dominated by Gentile Christians. It was the most significant demographic church uh, demographic shift in, that, in church history at that time. 
Now, that's the first century. Let's fast forward to the 21st century. Because right now in the 20th and 21st century, we are about to witness and we are in the process of witnessing the same tremendous demographic shift that occurred in the first century. That what we saw in the first century was the shift from a Jewish-centric and Jewish-centered Christianity to a Gentile population Christianity. And now we're about to shift, see a shift from a Northern American and a, and a European-centric Christianity to a global African, Asian, and Latin American-centered Christianity. So let's ask this question. In the year 1950, if you were to say, what is the typical face of a Christian in the year 1950? So let's say we got all the Christians in one room and we picked out a person and said, this person represents Christianity in the year 1950. That answer was pretty easy. The person, the typical Christian in the year 1950 was a white male, about 50 years old, very affluent, living in an upper middle class suburb, probably outside of a large city in Chicago. That was the very typical face of Christianity in the year 1950. If you were to make that declaration, here are the typical faces of Christianity in 1950, you would be absolutely correct. That's the face of Christianity. But let's ask the question right now in the 21st century and say, what is the typical face of the Christian in the year 19, 2010? Right now, what does the typical Christian look like? Well, the typical face of Christianity is no longer that white male, upper middle class living in the uh, Midwestern suburb. The typical face of Christianity is a Nigerian peasant woman outside of Lagos, is a Mexico City teenager, is a Seoul University student in South Korea. That now is the typical face of global Christianity. In fact, there's an interesting book written by Barrett and Johnson. It's the Atlas of Christianity. And in the year 1900, if you were to put a pinpoint at to the demographic center of Christianity in the world, it would be smack dab in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It would be right in between North America and Europe. If you were to take that same pinpoint and move it to the place where it is right now, the center of Christianity right now, it would be in Timbuktu, Africa. That's how far the center of Christianity has moved from North America and Europe to a Eastern and Southern orientation. And in fact, that pinpoint would be inaccurate every 10 minutes. Every 10 minutes, you would have to move a little further south and a little further east because that's how fast Christianity is moving from the north and the west to the south and the east. Over the past five centuries or so, meaning the last 500 years from 1500 to the year 2000, we could talk about Christianity being wrapped up in the story of Europe and North America. This is a quotation from the next Christian by Philip Jenkins. And you can say that there was a European Christian civilization. But Jenkins also writes that in the last century, the 20th century, what we've actually seen over the past century is the shift from the northern American and European-centric Christianity to Africa, Asia, and Latin American-centric Christianity. So that in this new century, in the 21st century, the vast majority of believers will be neither white, nor European, nor Euro-American, but they will be of African, Asian, and Latin American descent. In fact, Jenkins has this wonderful line. He says that talking about a white Christian in the, in the new millennium will be similar to talking about a Swedish Buddhist in the current decade. That's how silly that was going to sound. That's how dramatic the face of Christianity is shifting. Let's look at some statistics that might help us understand some of these changes. In the year 1900, if you got all the Christians in one room, you would find that 68% of those Christians would be found on the European continent. 68% of the Christians in the world were in Europe, and 14% of the Christians in the world would be in North America. Now look at that small percentage of Christians in Africa and a small percentage of Christians in Asia. However, by the year 2005, the percentage of Christians in the world in Africa is jumping to 19%. Asia jumping to 17%. Europe just drops through the floor down to 26%. So if we were to look at the non-white continents of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, the majority of the church numerically right now is non-European descent. This is a major shift that has occurred within our lifetime. So in the year 1900, you have 83% of the Christians in the world being of white uh, uh, pigment, pigmentation. I, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, and then you have the rest of Christianity of non-white. And then in the year 2005, the majority, the clear majority of Christians in the world are African, Asian, and Latin American. The projection is that by the year 2050, 
71% of the Christians in the world will be in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And less than 30% of the Christians in the world will be in Europe and North America. And that number is actually inaccurate as well. I had put in quotation marks, white and non-white. Because if you were to go to Europe right now, the fastest growing church in Kiev and Moscow are African churches. The fastest growing church in London is a Nigerian church. The fastest growing church in Sweden is an African church. So in all the major cities in Europe even, the fastest growing churches are non-European churches. So that that number is actually inaccurate. And also I'm going to argue that in the United States, the majority of Christians in America are non-white. So that if we were to look at that number again and can take into account the large percentage of ethnic minorities in Europe and North America that are Christian, I would argue that 80 to 85 percent of the Christians in the world will be non-white by the year 2050. So in the year 1900, 80 to 85 percent of the Christians in the world were white. By the year 2050, 80 to 85 percent of the Christians in the world are going to be non-white. In only 150 years we are reversing 1,500 years of church history. Within our lifetime, there is this cosmic, phenomenal shift that is going on where the center of Christianity shifts from Europe and North American and those of European and American, North American descent to an African, Asian, and Latin American orientation. By the way, this is nothing new. This is a done deal. Missiologists, church historians have been following this trend for years and years and years and saying, this is not something that's going to happen. It has already happened. The reality is, in the year 2010, we are living in a world that is majority, minority Christians. This is the amazing story of God at work. The shift from a European and North American centric Christianity that has dominated Christianity for nearly 1,500 years has now shifted to Africa, Asia, and Latin America. This is the good news that God has taken the gospel no matter where, uh, we, uh, the, no matter what the barriers might be. He's taken the gospels into all the corners of the world. Praise the Lord. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. Like I said, this is all a kind of a done deal. Most of us have read about this. Most of us have documented this. We know that the shift has occurred in global Christianity. But here's a challenge. The shift is not only happening in terms of global Christianity. The shift is also happening in American Christianity. And that American Christianity, which again in 1950 would have been dominated by white middle class Americans, right now is shifting to a majority minority population in the United States. Not just in the world, but in the United States. Jenkins writes that the passage of the Immigration Act in 1965 might be the most significant event of that particular decade. He also writes that the U.S.'s ethnic characteristic will become less European, less white, and all that it implies for religious and cultural patterns, it is becoming a much more multicultural nation. And we know this. We know that this nation is becoming much more multicultural. We can look at the statistics that in 2008, a third of the U.S. population was ethnic minorities. That was two years ago. A third of this nation was ethnic minorities. Now, here's a statistic that, threw, that blew me away. By the year 2023, 13 years from now, the majority of our children are going to be ethnic minorities. The majority of our children. And so as we're talking about youth ministry, we better know how to do cross-cultural youth ministry well. Because in the next 10 to 15 years, the majority of our children are going to have a real cross-cultural experience in life. That's going to be their reality. And then they're going to walk into the church and find that that's not the reality in the church. And they're going to say, how come the church can't keep up with what the world is doing? So by the year 2023, the children will be ethnic minorities. And by the year 2042, 2050, the sociological numbers vary. But within our, many of our lifetimes, by the year 2040 or 2050, the majority of Americans will be ethnic minorities. Now, just a couple of notes here. The first note here is that by 2023, the U.S. children are going to be ethnic minorities. That means that that number of the U.S. minority population overall being over 50%, that's a done deal. You, know, I, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to worry about immigration. You know, they have all these folks say, we got to stop immigration because America's got to stay a white nation. Right? I mean, you've heard that. That's the, the, some of the broadcasters on television and some of the, even the books and some of the even politicians have said, we've got to keep America white. And we got to keep the brown folk out. And so in order to do that, we have to keep the brown folk out so that we can keep this nation a majority white nation. i got news for them. Unless you start killing off children, we are going to be the majority in this country. 
Because by 2023, the majority of children in America will be minorities, and they're going to grow up. So here is the reality that we are dealing with here in the United States. Now, this is an interesting trend in that we're seeing that the majority of Americans are going to be non-white. But I would argue that the trajectory in the American church is actually moving faster than the trajectory in the American population. Meaning that Christians in America are more likely to be ethnic minority even before those dates that we see up there. And you all here are a representation of what God is doing in American society and in the church in America. This is the exciting news. Now, here's something that's interesting, though. About a year ago, right around Easter time, you, you all know this, but right around Easter time, they always put out the time in Newsweek that talks about Christianity. They're trying to sell a few extra issues. So right around Easter, they put Jesus on the cover because, you know, Christians are going to go out, hey, Jesus is on the cover of time. i got to buy it. So what they do every year in Time and Newsweek is put Jesus or the church or something positive about Christianity on the cover, except for Easter last year. Easter last year, there was an article by the, uh, by the author John Meacham. And John Meacham wrote an article called The End of Christian America. And in it, the cover was actually very dark. It was, it was all black cover with red lettering in the shape of a cross. And it was talking about the demise of Christianity in America. And so there is this perception that Christianity in America is in decline. There have been a number of studies that kind of pointed to this. The Pew study, the ARIS study. But these studies are saying that Christianity in America is in decline. Well, one of the ways that this came out is that in that Meacham article... What happened was it was opened by uh, a uh, president of a, a southern seminary, and what he wrote was, we knew, uh, the, what the numbers have shown is that Christianity in the Northwest is declining severely. But he also lamented the fact that Christianity in the Northeast has been declining severely as well. So what Meacham says, uh, or rather what this uh, uh, seminary president says, is isn't it terrible how we've lost the Northeast? Isn't it terrible how we have spiritually lost New England? And he's lamenting the fact that, you know, this was the place where you had the great revivals of Edwards and the history that Moody became a Christian here and all the great revivals that have occurred in the Northeast. Those days are long gone because Christianity has declined in the Northeast. But he had it absolutely wrong. There was an author by the name of Diana Eck, she teaches at Harvard University, who said that the more immigrants come into the United States, the less Christian America is going to become. She was claiming that when immigrants come, they bring their faith with them. So that when Indians come from India, they're going to bring their Hindu faith, and you're going to see Hindu temples rise up. When Arabs come from, uh, from the Middle East, they're going to bring their Muslim faith, and they're going to, you're going to see more mosques. While it is true that you will see more mosques than before, and you will see more temples than before, the fact also is that many of these Indians are Christians. Many of these Arabs are Christians. And there is a higher percentage of Christians in those communities here than overseas. So it's not that Christianity is declining in, declining in America. Christianity is increasing because of the ethnic minorities and the immigrants that are bringing our faith into this country. That's the reality that we're dealing with right now. Let's look at some more statistics. The fastest growing denominations are the Baptists and the Pentecostals. In other words, but uh, I, got, I got to do a little caveat on this uh, statistic. This Baptist includes all Baptists, Southern Baptists, American Baptists, and National Baptists, Progressive Baptists, all the Baptists. If you've got all the Baptists in one room, it would be very confusing. But let's say you've got all the Baptists <laughs> in one big room, 64% will be white, and the other percentage will be non-white. Same thing with Pentecostals. It's all the denominations in Pentecostalism. Got them all in one big room. You would have a very multi-ethnic gathering. So those are the largest and fastest growing denominations. The smaller and declining denominations tend to be mono-ethnic. They tend to be predominantly white. So Lutheran church is 96% white. I'm still trying to figure out who the 4% non-whites are in the Lutheran church. I don't know. So you've got at the Congregational UCC church, that's 89% white, and the Episcopalian Anglican church, that's 89% white. All of these denominations that tend to be mono-ethnic, that tend to be in the Anglo communities, are the fastest declining and the smallest denominations. So what we're seeing in the United States is that the white church is actually in very sharp decline. And it is the African-American church, 
It is the immigrant church. It is the Asian churches. It is the African churches, the Latino churches, the Spanish-speaking churches. All these churches that are of, of within, outside of the Anglo community, these are the churches that are growing by leaps and bounds. So let's do one more kind of a graph here. So what you see on the left-hand column, the far left-hand column, this is from statistics by Dave Olson in the book, The American Church in Crisis. Now, what, it, what Olson did was he was trying to measure church attendance in America. And in previous attempts to measure church attendance, they did phone surveys, Gallup polls and Barna polls, and they were finding 50 to 60 to 70 percent of Americans were, said they were going to church on a typical Sunday. Now, I don't know how many of you are out on the streets at about 10 or 11 o'clock on a Sunday. You know that's a lie. You know that that's not true, that 50 to 60 to 70 percent. They're in the malls, maybe, on Sunday, but they're not in the churches. So they were claiming, 50 to 60 to 70 percent were claiming to go to church on a Sunday. Now, the way they did this survey was they would call somebody up and say, did you go to church on Sunday? And they would say, well... Okay, yeah, I guess I went to church on Sunday. So the Gallup poll has been very accurate in predicting presidential races because people tell the truth when they ask, who are you going to vote for? But the Gallup poll is completely inaccurate when they talk about church attendance. People, people lie about whether they went to church or not. So the other way to count how many people went to church is actually to count how many people went to church through the denominational statistics. Now, these might also be slightly inflated, but what it tells us is that attendance in the church is also declining, even if we use those numbers. That you see in the far left, in 1990, 20% of the, of the American population attended church on a Sunday, and then it's now down to 17.5%. This is in 2005. What you'll notice is a relatively flat line in the far left column, which is evangelical Christians. Evangelical Christians, that will include Baptists, Pentecostals, those who are of evangelical faith, kind of believe in the scriptures, uh, believe in the divinity of Christ. That would be the evangelical churches. You'll notice a relative flat line. The second column, there is mainline churches. The mainline churches would be the Methodist churches, the Lutheran churches. You'll see a, a sharp decline. Methodist churches, um, the mainline churches were 4% of the population were attending mainline churches, and it's down to 3% within a 15-year time period. And you're saying, that's not so bad. Well, it's only a 1% drop. But what is it proportionately? It's a 25% drop. So the mainline churches, in only 15 years, lost 25% of their attendance. That's a huge drop. Now look at the Catholic churches. You're also seeing a major drop in the Catholic churches, and that also is more pronounced because many of the uh, immigration from Latin America are, of Catholic, uh, are, are Catholic, and even with that uh, jolt, you're still seeing this sharp decline in the Catholic churches. So now you're saying, well, man, most of us here are evangelical. We fall into the far left column, so we're doing okay. We're keeping up. We're not losing ground. But here's an interesting thing. I was at a conference a few years ago on the topic of immigration. And they were asking the question, uh, the one person who was a denominational official was talking about how his, his denomination was a small, mid-sized denomination that was not growing much, but it wasn't losing ground. What he confessed, however, is we do look like that number on that far left column. We're kind of flat, maybe a little increase. But if you take out the ethnic minorities and the immigrants from our numbers, our numbers are just as bad as the mainline churches. We're losing 20 to 25 percent of our congregations that are mostly in the white communities. So this is the reality of the church in America. We are seeing the decline of the Anglo churches and the sharp rise of the churches in uh, ethnic minority communities. Here's another statistic. Uh, the, the blue is Anglo. The purple is black, African, and African American. The yellow is Asian. Uh, uh, who did that? I went, okay. So the yellow is Asian. Uh, the, the far right, kind of a light green, that's Hispanic. So what you see, what you'll notice first of all, is that the Hispanic population is the fastest growing kind of across the board. So we're seeing that growth, that's the reality of the way the world is right now. But what you'll notice is that one, the one place where you see the sharp decline is actually Anglos in the Northeast, the whites in the Northeast. And they are leaving in droves from the Northeast, and where are they moving to? The South. Okay, keep that in mind. Whites are leaving the Northeast, and they're headed towards the South. Now, here's an interesting overlay to that statistic. You're seeing in the South a decline of Christianity, in fact, more than other regions. And what's the only region that's seen growth of Christianity? The Northeast. You'll see a slight uptick in that far left column is Northeast. The second column is the South, Midwest, and then the West. What you see in the Northeast is an increase in church attendance, while there's a decrease in church attendance in the South. So if you were to superimpose these slides, you would say when white people leave a city... 
the church grows. <laughs> when whites show up in a city, the church declines. Now, what we are seeing then is the changing face of Christianity in the United States. There is a notable and noticeable decline in the white churches and a noticeable increase in the churches of the ethnic, immigrant, multi-ethnic communities. And we saw a little bit of this earlier, the quiet revival. Now, I'm actually from the Maryland area. I was born in Korea, but my family moved to the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area, and that's where I grew up. And I went to college in New York, and I came back home, and I was getting ready to go to seminary. And my pastor had gone to Gordon-Conwell, so I said, I want to go there too. So we were, I was getting ready to uh, enroll at Gordon-Conwell, and there I was getting ready to go, and the church started getting really worried for me. They got worried for me because they said, you know, Boston is a really secular place. So, no, is Boston a really secular place? Boston is really, it's, it's a post-Christian city, and there, there aren't that many Christians there, and you're going to suffer in your faith. I said, oh, no, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to seminary in a dead, spiritually dead city. So there I am driving in my little car, driving up I-95 to start seminary, and I'm fearful. I'm scared to death. I can't come to Boston to study spirituality because there is no spirituality in Boston. That's what I've been told. Now, those of you who are coming from outside of Boston, that's actually a pretty common story. People say that, you know, hey, New England, they had great revivals back in the day. But right now, oh, spiritual death. Spiritual, spiritual death. And that's what I was told, and that's what I was afraid of. And then I get here, and I say, whoa, wait a minute. There is some amazing stuff going on here in the city of Boston. There is some amazing work that God is doing here in the city of Boston. This is a quiet revival, but it is off the charts in what God is doing here in the city of Boston. These are some statistics that I've learned from Doug and Judy Hall of the Emmanuel Gospel Center and the great research that they've been doing that in 1970, there were only about 300 churches in the city of Boston. Now, most of those churches have closed their doors, and you know what those churches are. They're now libraries and community centers. You can go to downtown Boston, and you've seen those churches. They're beautiful buildings, but they have like 10 people meeting there on Sunday. And they, they are beautiful buildings that just is incredible architecture, but they can't even use the sanctuary because they can't keep that sanctuary heated. And it's only 10 people anyway, so they meet in the back room with a little space heater. Those are the churches that have been in decline. Those are those 300 churches. Half of those churches have shut their doors. But the current number, I think this is actually in 2005, is that there are over 600 churches. You saw the graph earlier in that video. There are over 600 churches in the city of Boston, and the overwhelming percentage of those churches are in the ethnic and immigrant communities. That's where the revival has come. You don't go from 300 churches to 600 churches, even though the population hasn't grown that much, and all of those new churches aren't in the Anglo community. They're actually growing in the ethnic minority communities. So another statistic from the uh, Emmanuel Gospel Center, within a six-year time period, 98 new churches were planted in the city of Boston. Isn't that great news? That's amazing. This is not that big a city, and 98 new churches were planted in the city of Boston. Now, of the 76 churches that reported the language of worship, more than half of those churches said they worshipped in a language other than English. So the majority of those new churches are worshiping a language other than English. My theory, though, is that of the 22 churches that didn't report back, they probably didn't call back because they were asked questions in English. So what we're probably talking about is that that 50% number is actually a lot higher than what we have right here. Now, that also doesn't account for churches like uh, Jubilee and other African-American churches that obviously conduct their services in English, but those churches are not counted in that as well, or new churches that have started in the Asian-American community that have their services in English, African-American churches that have started, a lot of Caribbean churches that have their uh, services in English, but would not be counted in that as well. So the overwhelming majority of churches, in uh, new churches in Boston are outside of the Anglo community. That's what God is doing here in this wonderful city. God is bringing a revival. These are the demographic shifts that we're seeing. Now, let's go back to Acts chapter 15. What was happening in Acts chapter 15? The exact same thing that we see here is what was happening in Acts chapter 15. In Acts chapter 15, you were seeing the shift from a majority Jewish faith to a majority Gentile faith. And at this moment, we're seeing a shift globally and in the U.S. from a majority white faith to a majority people of color faith. That change has already occurred, and it will uh, speed along the next 10, 15, 20 years, both globally and in the United States. Now, here's the interesting parallel for me. 
The story of Acts chapter 15 and the Jerusalem Council is that initially the dominant church was unable to deal with these changes. The dominant culture could not handle the fact that they were about to lose the majority and about to lose the power because they had been able to shape Christianity in their cultural image for so long that they were not willing to let it go and allow a new group to shape the cultural face of, that new, of, the, of the church that was emerging. So what we're seeing right now is the same thing that we saw 2,000 years ago. The dominant culture is oftentimes fearful of letting the church pass on to the next generation that does not look like them. Because the next generation looks like this group, looks like those who are sitting around this room. That's the next face of Christianity. So what I would argue in the early first century is that in Acts chapter 15 and verse 1 and 5, we see this example, that there was a captivity of the early church to Jewish culture more than the teachings of Jesus. They wanted to look more like the culture that the, that the faith originated from rather than what Jesus actually preached. I call this the Jewish captivity of the early church. So you see about these Judaizers who say, if you want to become a Christian, you first have to become a Jew. And in order to become a Jew, you have to get circumcised. So they're saying, you have to go to great lengths, literally. You have to go to great lengths to become a Christian. You have to do all these things, jump through these hoops, make these things happen. You have to become culturally Jewish, and then we'll accept you into the Christian faith. The barrier was this, what I would call the Jewish captivity of the church in the first century. The church, in order to go beyond that captivity, needed to be released, unleashed, from that captivity in order to go forth into all the world. What I would argue is that 2,000 years later, we are dealing with the Western white cultural captivity of the American church. We are dealing with a Western white cultural captivity of the church that defines Christianity by standards of the West rather than by the scriptures, by the dominant culture's value system rather than by what the word of God actually preaches. Now, let's take a couple of examples of this. I'm going to put a few of these up. I'm not going to uh, speak on them, but you can write these down. Uh, but I want to give a few examples of this. The first example is how individualistic we are in God's Word when the Scriptures actually say something different. Now, uh, when I was moving from Boston to Chicago, I packed all my books. And one of the books I found was this comic book. And it was a comic book on Western philosophy. I mean, if you can read Western philosophy as a comic book, you got to go for it. So I got this book on Western philosophy written in comic book form, and I followed along. And what I found out was that a comic book got it. The comic book understood that the central tenet of Western philosophy is individualism. Now, what has happened is in the Western cultural captivity of the church, we have adopted the Western philosophy of individualism above what the scripture actually teaches. Let's think, for example, about the Bible. Now, as a seminary professor, as a pastor, I've read through the Bible a few times. And what I find in the Bible is that there's one, two, maybe three books of the Bible written to individuals. Timothy, Titus, Philemon, which nobody's read anyway. So you've got these three books of the Bible, short books of the Bible at that, written only to individuals. The rest of the Bible is written to the church in Ephesus, the church in Thessalonica, the people of God, the nation of Israel, the church in Corinth, they're written to communities. But if you think about most sermons in America, they don't talk about the community that's charged with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We talk about the individual. We talk about how the individual can be a better individual. We talk about the individual making it in the world as an individual. Instead, the scripture actually calls us to read it in the context of the people of God rather than as isolated individuals, which is oftentimes how we're taught to read scriptures. Now, let me get a little bit controversial here. There are places where we, uh, uh, we, uh, we look towards a Western culture for our, or our American culture or a white American culture to shape our understanding of scripture more than the scriptures themselves. So, for example, I have read through the Bible and I have found uh, absolutely zero references about the right to bear arms. Now, please don't get me wrong. I am not opposed to the right to bear arms. It's a constitutional thing. I don't want to change the Constitution in that way. I'm just saying I just haven't seen it in the Bible that Christians have the right to bear arms. Okay, not a problem with me. It's just not in here. Now, on the other hand, 
I've read through the scriptures and have encountered over and over and over and over again that we have a responsibility to treat with love, compassion, and justice the alien and the immigrant among us. Is that not in the scripture? Now, why is it then that when we walk into most churches, there are going to be more members of the NRA in a church than there are going to be those who advocate for immigration reform? Where has our Christianity been shaped? By the word of God that says, care for the alien and immigrant among us, or by the culture that says you have the right to bear arms? What is defining our Christianity? Is it the scriptures themselves, or is it a Western white cultural captivity of the church? We need to move and unleash the gospel in ways that takes the gospel outside of the narrow parameters that we put them in in terms of a westernized Christianity and unleash the gospel so that the church may continue to go forth into Africa, Asia, Latin America, African American community, Asian American community, Latin American communities here in the United States. We, are, we need the freedom from the cultural captivity. Now, how does this happen? And this is my challenge to you that I want to close with. My challenge to you is that in order for the gospel to move beyond Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, there had to be an unleashing of the gospel, and there had to be the leadership that had the foresight to prepare the next generation. And that's my challenge to this gathering. Prepare the next generation for what is to come. It has already come, in fact, but it's coming faster and faster. It is moving faster and faster. Prepare the next generation to lead these communities into an understanding that the world is changing and the gospel is going forth. We can tag along or we can be left behind. We can jump on and say, God, you're doing a great work. I want to be a part of it. Or we can say, oh, I'm not sure I want to go in that direction. That changes the way I look at Christianity. The leadership must be called to a higher level of accountability to train up the next generation in particular. Now, I get asked to speak at Christian colleges a lot. Less so now because of some of the stuff that I say at Christian colleges. <laughs> a few years ago, I was asked to speak at a Christian college, and I was talking about this changing face of Christianity. And here's what I said. I said, if your school is not preparing you for a multi-ethnic future, by giving you non-white professors and mentors and staff and administrators that can mentor you, prepare you for the next generation, your school is ripping you off. You need to go and ask for your money back because <laughs> that's why I don't get invited back. You need to ask for your money back because they're training you for the church 50 years ago rather than the church for 50 years from now. We need to prepare our young men and women to be ready for the changes that are coming but that are already here. The leaders for the next generation. Let me close with these strong three steps that I want us to take. One is we need to educate our youth. We need to educate our youth. We need to educate our youth in the cultural context that we're coming out of because that's of great value and worth. God has given us this culture to express our faith in the context of our culture. So let's educate them in the context of our culture, but also let's educate them and give them the skills to deal with the world that's out there. I am... I, I, I teach at a seminary now, and I've been, one of the, the difficulties in encountering higher education is that there are so few PhDs of color and so when Christian colleges say they want to hire more faculty of color, they say, well, we can't hire folks because there are so few PhDs of color. So what I'm asking for are those of you who are in ethnic and immigrant churches is to challenge your youth to go and get their bachelors, get their masters, and get their doctorates. Because those changes can happen in the pol political realm, the social realm, the educational realm. Sometimes the best shapers and framers of the way we think in Christian community comes out of these Christian colleges and Christian seminaries, and we need to train up leaders for that. I'll give you an example of this. I have a former intern here, and when I was a pastor in Cambridge, he went through CUM. Praise the Lord for CUM. He went through CUM. He went on to do his uh, THM at Princeton, and now he's doing doctoral work, and he is studying early African church history. The first churches were African. Most of us don't know this because we think history, church history started with Luther. It didn't start with Luther. It started in the African context. But most American Christians have no clue. And part of the reason is, is that he is among about 20 people that are studying this field of African Christianity. And he is the only African American studying the early African church. 
and he is taking out loans all over the place because he can't afford to go to the school, but he wants to do it because God has called him to be the only African-American studying the early African church. Now, that, that can't be right. That can't be right. Now, I'm doing some writing right now about the uh, evangelical movement among African Americans in the 1970s. The reason I, as an Asian, am writing this is because there aren't enough African American his church historians to write some of these stories. So we need, within our communities, to raise up leaders in education, get them to get through their uh, bachelors, get them to get their masters, get them to get their doctorates, and the church should pay for it. I would offer a second challenge in addition to the education. The second challenge is creativity. Creativity. God created us to be creative. Genesis 1 is all about the creativity of God. And when God breathed his spirit into the flesh of humanity, he breathed not only the spirit, but the spirit of creativity. And that spirit of creativity animated us to become procreative but also recreative. Procreative means we can have children and raise them up, but we can also be recreative in the creation of culture. And so the cultural context that God has called into is not an accident. The cultural milieu, the cultural experience is a gift from God to us that we might express to God what we experience out of our cultural context. Here's the story. When we get to the end of the days, our culture is not going to be washed away. Do you know that? Our culture, we're not going to just get to heaven, we're going to sing, you know, four-part harmony. There's going to be more to it than that. Not all of us are going to be wearing robes, other folks are going to be dancing, and their folks are going to be doing all sorts of stuff that comes out of the cultural context, because that reflects the creativity of God. So don't sell out the culture. Don't sell out the way God has made you. And I'll, I'll, I'll phrase it in this way. One of the things about the changing face of Christianity is that it is very easy for us to slip into a mode where we're trying to get the acceptance of majority culture while at the same time losing what God has made us uniquely to be. The example is this. Back during the time of apartheid, uh, we know about apartheid in South Africa. There was this tremendous segregation and, and categories were created for oppression. And so there were certain categories created. The Japanese businessmen who went to South Africa didn't like those categories. And now they couldn't be considered white because they were not white by the South African standards. They couldn't be considered black or coloreds or any of these other, or even Asian, because many times the Asians meant the, uh, the, uh, the trade class of mostly South Asian Indians. So the Japanese businessmen said, you can't put us into these other categories because we won't fit those categories and we won't have the rights. Now, obviously, South Africa wanted the Japanese businessmen there, so they said, we're going to create a new category. And that category is called honorary white people. So we're going to make you honorary white people. Now, that's laughable. But how many of us in the church are trying to become honorary white people? When we were created in the image of God for a purpose and a direction, God made me an Asian man. And I am proud to be an Asian man. Now, I am thrilled that I'm an Asian man, first and foremost, that I'm an Asian man in Christ. But that Asian man part doesn't go away because God created me this way for a purpose and an intentionality. So I don't want to be an honorary white person. I want to be a Christian. I want to be a believer. I want to follow the scripture and the word of God. But I want to do it in the context that God has raised me, the cultural context as an Asian American man. The final challenge I'll raise for us as leaders, as we, especially as we think about the next generation, is are we willing to have the heart for the next generation. It is easy to be right. It is harder to be loving. It is easy to know the truth. It is harder to live that truth through love. The thing is, we can get all the right doctrine, and if we still have not love, we're a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. I pastored a church that had a lot of young people. Started off as college students and the young adults, and you know what happens when they get college students and young adults, they actually meet each other and they want to get married. So for a while there, the 10 years that I was in Cambridge, I think I did like 40, 50 weddings. It was like a wedding a day, it felt like at one point. I was doing weddings all the time. Bishop, you know this. Pastors, you know this. You run out of material after a while. I mean, how many times can you preach 1 Corinthians chapter 13 in three different ways? I mean, you start running out. It's the same people coming to the weddings. How many times am I going to run out of material? So I ran out of material one year. So I got to try something a little bit creative here. So I brought the bride and groom to the front of the room. 
And I said to the groom, I want you to scream at the top of your lungs. I will always be right. I will never be wrong. And this fool gets up and says, I will always be right. I will never be wrong. (laughs) Then I turned to the bride and said, I want you to say, I will always be right. I will never be wrong. And this fool says, I will always be right. I will never be wrong. So I said, good. I have just solved every fight you're going to have for the rest of your life. (laughs) Because you will never fight about who's right. Because you have declared before God and these witnesses that you will always be right and never be wrong. So you never have to fight over who's right. Now your fight is over who gets to be more loving. Can you imagine the fights you... No, I want to be more loving than you today. No, I want to be more loving than you today. Not I'm right and you're wrong, but I want to be more loving. That's what the church wants to see. Yes, we should be right. Yes, we should know the truth. But we should live that truth in love and operate that truth and love. I'll tell the story. Because of what I find is oftentimes when we think about these great things that God is doing and the way that God is moving, we sometimes think we have to work just as hard to make it happen as well. And that's one of the things that I think we as, especially as ethnic minorities, oftentimes feel. Because we're up against it, aren't we? Because we go into the world and the rest of the world doesn't look like this at times, right? We go into our businesses and our jobs and the rest of the world doesn't quite look like this and we have to kind of adjust and adapt. So we're oftentimes up against it and then we come into the church and oftentimes we use that same kind of mentality of having to work that extra mile and work that extra step in order to earn and achieve the, the blessings of our Father. And even as we're looking at the next 40 years and what God is doing, some of us might be thinking, I got to work that extra mile or do that extra thing in order to earn the Father's love so that this thing can happen. I want to challenge you that it is not about our work, but it is about the Lord's work. It is about God who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever hope or imagine. It is about a God who every time we make mistakes picks us up and does not allow us to fall again. But even if we were to fall, he picks us up again. And then we fall again, he picks us up again. He is a God of grace. He is not a God of works. Several years ago, as I, when I started seminary here, I was coming to the end of my seminary years. It was coming to the end of that time. And I don't know how many of you have either been to seminary or are planning to go to seminary. Seminary will tear you up. It will rip you apart. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to tear you down. So at the end of it, you got nothing left. You can only turn to God. That's the role of seminary. If you want that experience, by all means, go. And that's a good thing because that's what pastors need. Pastors need, we, in order to be prepared for the pastor, we got to be torn down so that God can build us back up again. So that happened to me in seminary. So my last year in seminary, I had been torn down and there was nothing left. But what I found out and realized was that this was actually a story of my entire life that I had been trying to achieve and attain. And every time I failed, I would feel like I failed God. It goes back to my childhood. My, my, we came to the United States when I was six years old, but when I was about nine or ten years old. My dad left our family. And when my dad left our family, my, our whole world kind of fell apart. So I'm a, I'm a, we're, we're a single-parent family. My mom, who doesn't speak much English, has got four kids she's trying to raise. We move into inner-city Baltimore to try to make it, make it work. And I grew up in a rough neighborhood because my mom didn't, had to work these, these long hours. And those of you who know, you know what I'm talking about, the immigrant story of working those long hours or the struggles of just trying to make it day by day. That was my mom's story. That was our family story. But what happened was that I developed this real resentment towards my father. And in fact, after my dad left, I didn't hear from him for about two or three years. One day, out of the blue, I get a phone call from my dad. And it surprised me because, wait a minute, I hadn't heard from this guy. I'm I'm like 11 years old. I don't know where he is, but here he calls out of the blue. And he starts quizzing me. He starts asking me things. He starts asking me things like, well, what sort of music are you listening to? Are you listening to classical music? What do you know about Rembrandt? What do you know about Beethoven? Who's your, fa- uh, who's your favorite Baroque musician? I think I said Picasso. I didn't know. I was 11 years old. <laughs> but he went down the list. What kind of grades are you doing? What are you, what are you doing at school? And for about 15 minutes, he listed off the list of things that I needed to do in order to earn his love. And my earthly father was telling me that if I wanted him to love me, I had to achieve and earn that love. Now, when you're 10, 11 years old, you internalize that message. You file it away. And you start living your life according to that pattern. So I started living my life according to that pattern. So I started to go and I'm going to get good grades in school because that's going to make my dad love me. I'm going to do all that I can to achieve and join clubs and get into the right schools because that's going to make my earthly dad love me. But then we start transitioning that, many of us, when we become Christians, we still have that tape recorder in our minds. 
And now we start thinking, in order for my heavenly father to love me, I need to also earn his love. And so that became, I'm going to be the president of my youth group. I'm going to be the president of my fellowship. I'm going to go to seminary and become a professional Christian because that's the way I'm going to earn my father's love. And so day after day, month after year, semester after semester, you try and try and work and work. And at the end of the day, you still feel like you're not good enough to earn the Father's love because the Scripture actually tells us, for all have sinned and continue to fall short of the glory of God. So what I did in seminary was I tried to get all straight A's. I tried to be active in the church, try to do all the things that would make me acceptable to my Heavenly Father, things that would earn the love of my Heavenly Father. But when I, at the end of, that, uh, end of those three years, I realized that I went down and made a checklist, a mental checklist of all the ways that I had failed my, earthly, uh, my heavenly father. I was not holy enough. I was not a good preacher enough. I was not enough of this. I was not enough of that. And I went down and made a list of all the ways that I had disappointed and failed my heavenly father. Around that time, I was pretty much ready to give up in ministry, pretty much ready to throw in the towel. Went away on this retreat, happened to be in, uh, in Canada. And I was in Canada, and there was this revival going on, and I was asking people to, pr- the people were praying for people. It was, a, it was a relatively small gathering, so I was getting a little nervous because I knew that, you know, in these gatherings, people come and pray for you, and I didn't want to be prayed for. Why? Because I knew that if they were getting prayed for, God was going to convict me of my sin and all the wrongdoings that I've done, and I was going to cry. I didn't want to cry. I was with my friends. I wasn't going to cry. So I kind of hit off into the corner while all the chaos is going on around me. I just kind of hit off into the corner. In fact, I was on my knees and I buried my face in my head. And I didn't want anybody to see me because I didn't want to cry. But somehow these prayer warriors found me. And there were about three or four of them that had come around and gathered. And they found me. And they started praying for me. I said, oh, man, they found me. They're going to pray for me. And they started praying for me. And I said, I'm going to cry. I'm going to weep. Because I started going over the mental checklist. These are the ways I've failed you, God. These are the ways that I failed you. And as people were gathering on, I started praying, God, look at all the ways that I let you down. Look at all the ways that I have miserably failed you. Look at this list, God. Look at the list of all the ways that I've let you down, that I do not live up to your standards. Look at the ways that I've let you down. And it's one of those moments as the folks prayed around me where you actually hear the voice of the Lord. And as I'm saying, God, look at this list of all the ways that I failed you, the voice of the Lord said, what list are you talking about? What list are you talking about? As far as the east is from the west, I've removed your iniquities from you. I have never kept a record of your wrongs. My love for you is not based upon the work that you do. It is based upon my grace. And even as God moves the church into this amazing future, it is not going to be our work that's going to earn this move of God. It is going to be the grace of God that allows the Spirit to come and fill this place. Let it be so, Lord. Let it be so.